reach Young Adult Ministry Sermons Online from Tuesday, November 2nd, 2021 by Philip Jackson, pastor to young adults at Evergreen Baptist Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, entitled Defending Unity from Matthew chapter 13, verses 18 through 35. Welcome. If you're new to Reach, um, we the the vision of this ministry is um, you know there. I, you guys, if you've been here for any any length of time, you've heard me say this that there is kind of an unspoken uh, culture in church life that um, we basically dump all kinds of resources on you when you're a kid. And then we double down when you're a teenager in student ministry. You go to Falls Creek. You do go to camp. You do all this stuff. And then, and then you graduate high school. And we don't say this out loud, but there is, this is very real and very true. The sentiment is come back and see us when you're married and you've got kids and you're worth something. And quite frankly, that's just not true. Um, it is a, it's a mistake. It's unbiblical. It is, um, in my opinion, it is um, one of the great blemishes on the church that um, young adults, young professionals, college students, people who are um, beginning their lives, that they are seen as unimportant. And um, over the last three years of doing ministry and young adult ministry, I have grown to be very, very defensive of young adults and young professionals. Um, to the point that when I am in meetings with other pastors and um, everyone's talking about all their programs and all the things they're doing, um, I get a little upset, honestly. Um, And it shouldn't be that way. And so if you're new to reach, if you're new to what we do, um, I want to communicate to you uh, a couple of things. Number one, that God absolutely has a place for you in what he is doing in the world. 100%. Number two, that God has equipped you to do anything that he has called you to do. Things like traditional worldly excuses for disobedience are things like, I don't have the right qualifications, I don't have the right degree, or I don't, I'm not in the stage of life to be able to do what God's called me to do because I don't have a family, I'm not married, I don't have children, um, I don't have dis- enough disposable income. I don't have the right job. I don't have the right. There's all kinds of things that we can put in that blank. And just quite frankly, none of that is true. God has equipped you. He has put you in a place to do um, ministry. And it's not about doing work. It is not about doing work. Being obedient to what God's called you to do is not about just filling a role and just, and just cranking out widgets. That's not it. The whole thing about being a a child of God is that God has invited us to be part of what he is doing in the world as he reveals himself to people, to those that don't know him. We get the divine privilege of being able to share in his purpose. And that's not something that is draining. That's not something that is exhausting. That is something that is both eternally fulfilling and present day right now fulfilling. And so reach exists because we, as a body, as a group, as a community, and as a church, as Evergreen, we believe that this is the most unreached demographic of people in our generation. Young adults are um, discarded. And they are, they are um, not seen as significant. And the reality is that that is, just, that is just such a huge mistake. And God has something that he wants to do in your life. And um, that's why we exist. That's why the name of this ministry is Reach. Because we want to reach young adults. Those that know Jesus and those who don't. Um, and this is, not just as, this is not just about going and making converts. This is about helping people grow into being a productive abiding, mature soldier of Christ. And that is my, my hope for you. That is my prayer for each of you. And uh, that's why we exist. That um, the day to serve is today, right now. The day to abide is today. Now, our message tonight um, is not part of a series. It just stands by itself. 
but we're going to talk about a popular passage of Scripture that is quoted out of context quite often. You guys know that I love passages that are quoted out of context, right? I can do all things through a verse quoted out of context. Um, We're going to be in John chapter 13 tonight. For those of you that don't know, that's from uh, Philippians. It is just always quoted, and it just doesn't have anything to do with your goals or how much you hustle. Just throwing that out there. Um, We'll talk about it later. We don't talk about it tonight. So turn over to John chapter 13. Um, We're going to talk about defending unity tonight. So the whole theme of this year has been unity. How has God um, not just equipped us individually, but how do we fit together um, as a unit? How do we fit together as community? I was talking to a uh, a young adult pastor in in Colorado Springs this summer, and he made an interesting observation. Um, And he, community is kind of the buzzword for young adults, young adult ministry, right? It's all about community. Where where am I going to go? Where the people are, right? And community in young adult ministry is the idol. It is the thing, because community is the most important. At least that's what I hear on a regular basis. And this young adult pastor told me, he said, you know, the challenge is that if you, that if you make the conscious decision to build your, to build your ministry, to build the ministry around community, you do it through, um, through things like, um, unstructured events, we're going to get together and we're going to go see a movie or we're going to get together and we're going to play a game or we're going to go do this thing or we're going to go eat food. Now, that absolutely has a place in community. But the challenge is that we live in a generation where young adult ministry is defined by those things. It's like, it's like a cupcake ministry. Everything is sweet all the time, right? But there's no meat. And so this young adult pastor told me, he said, the challenge is that you are one hurt feeling away from everything crumbling. Because if we don't learn how to deal with conflict, if we don't learn how to deal with sin, if we don't know, learn how to deal with, with um, emotions, if we don't learn how to deal with truth, we are not equipped to be able to even live together in a community. Because here's what happens. Somebody, a group of people is built, the, the community is built around just doing stuff that's fun together. One person gets upset because of decisions that they make. They allow sin to creep into their life. The community is not equipped to be able to lovingly pull them in and say, hey, let me encourage you in how you need to walk with Jesus. This is not good for you. This is not helpful. It says it's going to hurt you. Since the community isn't equipped, what happens is that person begins to, because of the conflict of the, in the, within their own heart and the sin that, they've, that they have let dwell there, they begin to build factions. Oh, this person said this about me, or this person did this. So they begin to accumulate their team. And the next thing you know, the ministry has split down the middle and we're distracted. And so the primary challenge for me as I step forward in obedience to try to lead reach is how do we cultivate a community that's built on truth. Now, you are not going to, um, you're not going to, ex- you're going to experience fun things here. We're going to do fun stuff. Reach giving is a great example. Um, our Utah trip this spring was a great example. Um, but I made a commitment to the Lord three years ago when I, when I took over as the young adult pastor at Evergreen. To me, I believe the scripture says that the only way that we are going to be able to face our generation is if we know the truth. That means that if I get up here and I give you a 20-minute cupcake sermon that makes you feel good, I have not done my job. I have not equipped you to face hard things. Because my goal, honestly, is that one day when the Lord takes my life and he takes me to heaven, my goal is that every single one of you is able to create another 40 people that can chase Jesus and storm the gates of hell for the sake of the gospel. That is my goal and my hope. And so I am not going to give you a cupcake sermon. I'm not going to give you easy things. I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask the Lord, okay, where do we need to go as a community? What is the next hard thing? Because I understand and I, and I believe that God's word is absolutely, has to be the foundation of who we are as a people. Has to be. And so... 
when I first started doing, um, you know, I, I've never been in ministry before up until three years ago. And so I began to do reading like, okay, young adults, I've always been a 65 year old trapped in this body. So how do you relate <laughs> to young adults? Right. And so as I began to research, I, I started to realize, I see things like there were common threads. Number one, you need to be entertaining. Copy that. All right. You need to be, um, you know, do your best to not let your appearance be a distraction. You need to relate to young adults and look nice and make sure that you're uh, presentable, right? Because if you're not presentable, people aren't going to want what you have. Uh, make sure your hair's on point. Make sure that you're styled correctly. Um, preachers with sneakers is a thing. Do not understand it, but it's a thing, <laughs> right? So, like, I have worn these same Converse All-Stars for the last probably seven months, and they're the only pair of shoes that really I will wear. I began to hear things like, you need to not ever, ever teach more than 20 minutes, ever, because you're going to lose them. Young adults don't have the attention span to listen and to process things more than 20 minutes long. It's like that, first off, that's kind of insulting. <laughs> and I began to, to realize that um, young adult ministry is pretty much just extended youth group, Right? And so um, I made some decisions. I thought, you know what? Reach can be whatever it is that I want it to be. So Lord, what do you want it to look like? We're going to have the best we can. We're going to do worship. Uh, and now we were on the struggle bus for a while, weren't we, Landry? You know? Um, Landry and Aaron, they know. Um, we're going to do worship as best we can. But we are gonna, we're not going to cut corners on how we offer the truth. So doing my best, I know that it gets late and we get kind of sleepy, but you're going to get a 45-minute lesson from me every time um, because I believe that the truth is important. It is crucial to how we face the world. So I say all of that kind of as a, as a precursor for this. Tonight's message is a hard message. It is one that is um, not culturally really, um, I guess, a not appropriate, appropriate is not the right word. It is not culturally um, hip with young adult perspective in young adult ministry. I'm going to say some things that you're going to be like, uh, okay. Um, but my job is not to tell you uh, what I think. My job is to tell you what the text says, and we're going to let the Holy Spirit do what he does, uh, which is to make us more like Christ. Okay, so we're going to be in John 13. So I'm going to read verses 18 through 30. And let me give you the, the, the background here. This is Jesus in the upper room. They've just finished the, uh, the Lord's Supper. Uh, he has just reclaimed, not reclaimed, but he has just renewed the Passover dinner to now be the Lord's Supper that we celebrate often, the Eucharist, right? The, the bread and the cup. And he gets down and he washes the disciples' feet. All 12 of them are there. And um, after he's done, then he is going to, to do some very specific particular things. Okay, we're going to start in verse 18, and we're going to read through this verse 30, and this is our introduction. Okay, this sets the scene. He says, um, I do not speak concerning all, uh, all of, concerning all of you. Sorry, I can't read. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he, in whom, and he whom receives me receives him who sent me. When he had said these things, he was troubled in his spirit and testified and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Now, side note, that word troubled, where it says he was troubled in his spirit, in every other context that that word is used in the New Testament, uh, it is used in the context of fear. So someone is, an angel appears to someone like Zechariah when, when the angel came to tell him that John the Baptist was going to be born. Um, he was afraid. Okay, so this whole thing about Jesus was never afraid, that's not a thing. Okay, he was afraid. Most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Verse 22. Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. Now there was, there was uh, leaning on, on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. That's the Apostle John. 
Simon Peter therefore mentioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. Then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? Now, in my sanctified imagination, there's the table is full of guys, right? All 12 are there. Peter's like, who's he talking, to, talking about? If he's going to tell anybody, he's going to tell John. John, you ask him. So John leaves over and he whispers, who are you talking about? Okay, so they have this little private dialogue. Verse 26, Jesus answered, It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. But no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. For some thought, because Judas had the money box, that Jesus had said to him, buy those things that we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. Having received the piece of bread, he then went out immediately, and it was night. Okay, a couple of things here before we get into the meat of our text. The first thing is that that, um, Jesus acknowledges in these first couple of verses um, that he has taught what he's about to say is only going to be for the people who actually are his. So verses 18 and 19, he says, I don't speak concerning all of you, because Judas is still in the room. I'm going to talk just to my people. Okay? And then he is, uh, whenever he says that those who uh, receive his followers, they're going to be the same as, uh, it's going to be the same as receiving him, Jesus himself. Okay, so he's already starting to carve out, okay, this message is not for everybody. This message is for my people. So, he identifies Judas as the person who's going to betray him, and also, Judas is the one that doesn't belong in the room. So, Jesus says, Judas, I need you to leave. Now, there is, there is a very real, um, it, is, it is biblically accurate to say that God loves everyone. That is true. But it is not biblically accurate or scripturally accurate to say that God does not have discernment and divide people, okay? There are two kinds of people in this world, those who are God's children and those who are not, okay? So these first couple of verses here, it tells us, Jesus is saying, I want just my people in here. Judas, you need to leave. That's what he's saying, okay? So the idea that, and this will all come around to when we get into these, these next few verses, but the idea that, Oh, well, no, this is, everybody's included. We're all, it's all going to be a good, happy, big, happy party. God absolutely does discriminate. 100%. He does that, he does that for a reason. Okay, now, I got to tell you, I have been wrestling with this passage of scripture for the last three weeks, and I've just about pulled out all my hair. I started back here. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Verses 31 and 32. Actually, let me read these, these, these next five verses and, and we'll break, break them apart. So, uh, 31. So when, when, he, when he had got out, he's talking about Judas, Judas, Jesus said, now the son of man is glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Little children, I, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. Okay, the first thing we need to define here about defending unity is the mission. What is the mission? Why is this, the, all the, our, our generation talks about love all the time. What are the two greatest commandments? Love God, love people. Absolutely accurate. Totally true. But consider this. These first two verses here, 31 and 32. Here's another translation here that says, Therefore, when he had left, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified. Okay, there's, a, there's some things here that, that kind of stack on each other. Okay, the first thing we're going to look at is the mission. The mission is Jesus waits for Judas to leave. And then, think about this. The next time that they're going to see Judas is actually the Garden of Gethsemane whenever he betrays Jesus. So Judas, Judas is out. Not only is he out, 
um, verse, uh, yeah, verse 27 says that the point that Jesus gave him the bread, he became demon-possessed, and then he was gone, okay? This first verse, this first word here says, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified. This word is really interesting because it is, it is a word that uh, is used elsewhere in Scripture that talks about a season of time. So here's, here's one of the things about the gospel. This is a timeline, okay? Beginning of time, end of time. So when you read your Bible, this is the cross right here in the middle. This is, the cross is literally the cornerstone of all creation right here the center of everything. Everything in the Old Testament pointed to the cross here. So God makes a promise to a woman named Eve in Genesis chapter 3. He says, listen, you all messed up. I get it. But girl, I love you, and from you, I will make all this right. Okay? He says, from your seed, meaning she is, a, a woman is going to be the one that ushers in the, the solution, the fix. And I think it's really important for us to understand that our culture does everything it can to devalue women. And I'm not talking about toxic masculinity only. I'm talking about how all of secular culture devalues women. It's been this way from the beginning. Okay, but God is the one who on purpose, he chooses to set, a, set apart women as the as the central point of how he is going to make things right. So he makes a promise to Eve. Eventually that makes its way to a man named Abram. God says, you are going to be the one that I'm going to fix all of this through. All of the nations of the world are going to be blessed through you. So after Abram, all of his descendants, the people of Israel, they begin to, um, they begin a relationship with God. And every single part of the Old Testament talks about that promise. To Abram, to the prophets, to the, king, to the kings uh, Saul and David and Solomon and all the others, they all point to one day this is all going to be made right, right here. And so we get to this point, Jesus is here. So he says, now is the time. That is this point forward. Jesus says, now is the time. This is what's called the kingdom of heaven. We've been waiting, 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 waiting. And Jesus is saying, okay, I'm about to change the game. That's what this word now means. I know that it seems totally obscure, but this is significant because we've been waiting for this point for thousands of years. He says, now the son is glorified. Now, I want you to think about this. This word glorified just blows my mind. So when I think about glorified, um, I think of God taking something, let's say this, this marker, he takes something ordinary and he raises it up. He elevates it, right? But that's not actually what this word means. It means the literal translation is um, to cause the dignity and worth of some person or thing to become manifest and acknowledged and to exalt to a glorious rank or condition. What this means is that God did not elevate Jesus and make him into something that he wasn't before. God is going to pull back the curtain of heaven so that everyone in the future from this point forward is going to be able to see who Jesus is. That's what it means to glorify. He's saying, I'm going to reveal to the world what I have been promising this whole time. In now, this moment, the Son, I, Jesus am glorified. God is going to reveal who I am to everyone. This is, um, this is what he talks about in Philippians chapter 2, where he says that, don't let this mind, don't let the mind be in you of Christ Jesus, who made himself low and took on the, the, the form of a man. He cloaked himself in skin so that he could live a perfect life and die for the atonement of our sins. There are, there are episodes within the Gospels where Jesus and who he is is revealed to his followers. To Peter, James, and John on the mountain where he's transfigured. And for a brief moment, they see him and who he is. They have been, there have been revelations about this, 
this type of a thing, but this is a game changer from this point forward. This has never happened before. He says, I am glorified. The Father is going to reveal who I am. But look at this next statement. He says, God is glorified in him. The Father is also revealed by the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Paul draws this picture in, in, in his letters to the churches, and he talks about how, how Jesus is the revelation of who God is. So consider this. Okay, I know, I know this is, it took me a second to try to map this out because it's, it's challenging. But here's the idea. Is that Jesus is saying right now, I am glorified in this moment. But not just me. The Father is also revealing who he is by revealing me. Okay? You tracking with me? So then he goes on to say, that if God is glorified, then God will also glorify him in himself. The Father is, um, think about this, that he is showing off heaven through what Jesus is, is about to do. Jesus, Jesus just, has just told them, I'm going to go away, I'm going to go away, I'm going to go away, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. I'm leaving you, I'm leaving you, I'm leaving you. And now, if, now he tells them, this is the moment that you all have been waiting for. But here's the thing, is that he doesn't just say this is something that's going to happen in the distant future. He says this is going to happen immediately. This is mind-blowing because what this means is that we don't have to wait any longer. Why is this significant to us? Why is this mission significant to us? Because everything comes down to this one thing, glorifying Christ and the Father. Everything comes down to this one mission statement, to glorify the Son and the Father. So how do we do that? We got to understand the battlefield. Look at this in verse 33. He says, Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I'm going, you cannot come. So now I say to you. The idea here is that Jesus is saying, you know what? I'm leaving. So from the, the apostles' perspective, they're thinking, well, he's the Messiah. He's going to be with us the whole time, right? But Jesus is saying, no, no, no. I'm changing the game. Everything's going to be, it's going to be different. So, I want you to understand though, I'm not going to be here. And he says it over and over again, but to the point that they start protesting later on in chapter 14. So, consider this. Okay, let's move on to verse 34 about the tactics. How are we going to accomplish this mission on the battlefield that we have? Now, I guess I, get, I need to, to identify this or... or there's two different things. There's a, there is what's called a theater of war, which is the, think about this. So like, if you think of World War II, if you guys know anything about World War II, you have the Pacific theater where we fought Japan, and then you had the European theater where we fought the Nazis, right? The theater is the broad category. The battlefield are the individual places of conflict. Okay? So if this is the theater... The battlefields are all within the theater. Okay, like that. Okay, so now, so we're on the battlefield. What tactics do we use to win? Look at verse 34. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. This, this is another thing. Like, some of you know that I've been studying Greek this semester, and I got to tell you, this is really frustrating. Um, because you know something is important, but until you finally uncover why it's important, it doesn't make sense to you, right? So um, I know this nuances. I'm starting to realize why preachers talk about the Greek and the Hebrew all the time, because English is just a terrible language. <laughs> it just is. It just really is. Like Greek, Greek, for instance, has four words for love, and we only have one. Right? I mean, there's all kinds of ways that, that a one word, it just doesn't, doesn't bring the, full, the fullness of it. So we've already talked about glorifying, right? This is, this is not just God elevating something. This is him actually pulling the curtain back from heaven. Here's the next thing. So he says this, he says, I am giving you a new commandment, or I give you a new commandment. The way that that word is actually written in Greek is it's not like, here, Elijah, I'm giving you this pen and it's done. That's not how this works. The word actually means that I'm giving you a perpetual state of being. 
He's not just giving them a rule to follow. He's not saying, okay, here's another one to check off your list. There's no, there's, there's no uh, limit or there's, there's, no, uh, there's plenty of rules to follow. He's not saying, oh, here's one more to tack on the end. He's saying, I am changing things. I'm giving you a perpetual new commandment. Okay, let's talk about that word commandment. Um, other translations translate it as instruction. Okay, again, English just sucks because... What he's saying here is, I am giving you not a commandment or an instruction. I'm giving you a new way of thinking. I'm giving you a new perspective. I'm giving you a new reality. This is why this is significant. Because now is the time. Now is the time right now. I'm changing things. I'm giving you a new perspective. What this means is that for the first time ever in human history, Jesus is saying, I'm going to give you What? The ability to love one another as I have loved you. Before this point in history, human beings did not have the capacity to love people like God did. This is the same type of love that's described when it talks about David being a man after God's own heart and the way that God felt about David. This is the way that, that God felt about Abram when it says that Abraham was a friend of God. This is how God felt about Enoch when it says that he walked with God and then was no more. For the first time in human history, Jesus is saying, God is saying, I am glorified in this. God is revealing heaven in this way that I am giving you the supernatural ability to love people like I love you. This is significant because it changes everything. Because the Old Testament law if from Deuteronomy chapter 6 is, is two greatest commandments. Love the Lord, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second one is like it. Love, the, love your neighbor as yourself. The challenge is that the Old Testament law was created to create compassion. To teach people how to see those in need. Those who are widows and orphans. Those who didn't have a family to take care of them. That was the purpose. But as with everything in the old law, it was not achievable. It led to this, this social system where you did, you did the bare minimum. Here's why this is crazy. This is, this is just insane. Is that he is saying, I am replacing this. You live in our generation long enough, especially in young adult circles, and you're going to hear, they will know you how you love. Love people. Love God, love people. Who's he talking to here? Is he talking to Everybody. No. Does this have anything to do with evangelism? No. Does this have anything to do with lost people? No. It does not. He says, you will be known, this commandment I give you, to love one another, love other believers. I'm giving you the supernatural capacity, let's let's forget about the lost people right now, To love your brothers and sisters in Christ. How? As I love them. So consider this. How does God love you? Does he love you enough to let you just rot away in your bad decisions? Or does he bring conviction? Does he love you enough to surround you with people who who will encourage you? Or does he leave you alone? Does he, did he, uh, while you were still a sinner, die for you? Greater love is no one than this, than him that gives his life for his friend, his brother or sister in Christ. He set aside his prerogatives, his priorities, his wants, his wishes, because he loves you. You are his child. Now here's a key distinction. James chapter 4 says that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He says, Do you not know that you pray for things to consume them on your own lusts because you want to fulfill yourself and your flesh? But don't you realize that the the spirit that's in you dwells jealously? God's not going to give you things that are going to hurt you. Here's the principle. Here's Here's the idea. Is that if you are a child of God, if you have submitted to his lordship, his his 
um, mastery. So the word in, this has also been driving me absolutely insane because it's the, it's the Greek word kurios. Kurios is translated Lord throughout the Bible, throughout the New Testament. It is a traditional Christian word, Lord. Jesus is my Lord and my Savior, right? Challenge is that we've had just basically attached this to Jesus' name. Like Christ. Like people think that Christ is his last name. That's not true. It's just what he is. He is the Christ. I have learned to start thinking about kurios not as Lord, but as its other definition. As Master. To those who are in Christ Jesus, who have submitted themselves to his lordship, making him master of their life, they will find mercy. But to those who have openly rejected his mastery of their life, Scripture says that they are something else. That they are the enemies of God. That they have no heritage with God. They don't belong to God. They are children of the evil one. It's not just about being broken and needing to be fixed. We have to understand that sinful people who do not belong to Christ, who have not made him their master, as children of God, we've got to understand that the love that we have for each other is reserved only for children of God. I don't love people who are lost the same way that I love you if you're in Christ Jesus. That is a hard thing for me to say. I don't have the capacity to love them like I love you. Why is that? Because in this passage of Scripture, what Jesus is saying is that for children of heaven, there is grace, there is mercy, and there is genuine love and brotherhood and sisterhood. But to those who are children of the enemy, there is no fellowship between light and darkness. There is none. Scripture says, do you not know that to be the friend of the world is to be God's enemy, to declare war on God? But what do we do? We look at our, our, the lost people in our life and we give them portions of our life that they don't deserve, that they should not be a part of. We're going to get to evangelism in a second. So don't get distracted with what I'm saying here. The reality is is that our tactics, the way that we see this, the way that we see godly love has to be seen correctly. I cannot love Haley the same way that I love someone who is lost. I can't love Lindsay the same way I love someone who is lost. I cannot love Sam the same way I love someone who is lost because the person who is lost is not part of my family. We see this microcosm in our own families. You love your family differently than you love everybody else, right? People that share your DNA, there's a reason for that. That's what Jesus is saying. I'm giving you the ability to love people, to love my children the way that I love you. I'm redefining things. In the same way that we can show love to God's family, he also gives us an opportunity to be able to get to those who don't know him. Look at verse 35. He says, but this all, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Is he saying that the people will know that you're going to be my disciples by how you love them? By how you love everybody? No. By how you love who? One another. Remember, Judas is not in on this conversation. He doesn't have a seat at the table. He has no inheritance. He doesn't belong. He's not part of the family, and he made that choice. How do we, how do we change the world through our godly living? We have an assumption that if I just live perfectly, if I just, maybe if I'm just made of plastic, and I just don't move and I do everything right, and I don't mess up, I don't embarrass anybody, I'm just perfect all the time, that somehow people are going to want what I have. It's like, it's, like in, uh, it's like in Toy Story, whenever Woody gets like stuck in the box, 
and he can't move because he's zip tied down. It's like we think that that's attractive to people. It's not. Just the church is not meant to be a museum. It's meant to be a hospital. It's a military hospital because we're at war. What he's saying here is that people are going to know that you're my disciples by how you love one another. When you first got involved in REACH, you probably came in here, didn't know anybody, may have known one or two people, and you're like, okay, well, here I am, the new person again. It's like third grade all over again. But you know what? I guarantee you, those that have been here for any length of time, you started to realize that these relationships are sweet. They're pretty nice. Wow. You know what? I like spending time with you. I like spending time with you. I like doing these things. I like studying God's word. I like being challenged. I like being in your life group. I like having you in my life. You know what? There are others who see that in you and they start to ask, hey, are, are, you, are you going to church anywhere? Are you part of any community anywhere? Yeah, I'm part of Reach. Or I'm part of Truth Over Trend. Or I'm part of BCM. Or I'm part of this community. You should come. You should be a part of what we're doing. How will people know anything about God? We show them not through plastic, artificial lifestyles, but through genuine, authentic Christian relationships. The most valuable evangelistic tool that we have is how we love one another. Because without that, we've got nothing. It's not because I don't like people that are not saved. I am that person. Only by the grace of God have I escaped that. But the reality is we spend so much of our time chasing lost people that we do it at the defiance of God's word. Evangelism has become a sales pitch. The Jesus juke. Hey, that's a nice, uh, those are nice shoes. You do a lot of skating? You know, you know who uh, also is a great skater? It's Jesus, because he can do all kinds of tricks. Best trick he's ever done is save my life. Let me tell you about that. <laughs> it's a Jesus juke. We do it all the time. Just pick some random thing about somebody, and then be all, just find a way. Oh, you know what that's like? It's like Jesus, because Jesus is awesome. But we don't realize that God's word says very, very plainly, the way that people will know that you're my disciples is how you love one another. Okay. I know that this is just a lot. Here's something I want to ask you. If you don't know Jesus, if you're like, man, that guy's really full of himself. I want to tell you something. I'm going to tell you this in love. You don't understand. You don't have the capacity to understand. For you, I've been sitting here talking for 45 minutes and you're like, okay, I'm ready to go home. I'm going to tell you right now, you have no capacity for true community apart from God. You have no ability to be able to live and to know and to be satisfied with who you are without a relationship with Jesus. That is just a hard fact. All of us are looking for something, and the thing that we're all looking for is to be right with God. And if you are not a believer, if you, do not, if you have not made Christ your master, all of this is just Greek to you. The challenge is that you have to humble yourself and say, you know what? I suck at this and I need help. Those who are in this room who, who have given their lives to Christ, they understand this fact. I am not important. I'm not special. I'm not awesome. No matter what my mom said, I am a dirty, rotten, horrible person. God's word says that the heart of man is desperately wicked and no one can know it. And if you don't believe me, spend five minutes on the internet. Because every person is a garbage human being. But here's the reality. Is that God loved us in this way. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If you don't know Jesus, I'm telling you right now, you need him. And if you don't know how to do that, if you don't know, don't know what that looks like, I would love to talk to you. If you are a believer... 
and you are doing everything you can to make lost people the cornerstone of your life and you neglect godly Christian relationships, I'm going to tell you in love, you are an idiot. You are hurting yourself. You are hurting the people around you who want you in their life, who are godly people, and you are living contrary to this scripture right here. Because there is no way that you can show the world that you belong to Christ, that you are his disciple, if you don't make time for your family in Christ. It is not possible. It is not true. God's word says very clearly, by this one thing, people will know that you're my disciples. How you love one another. Well, if you spend no time with God's people, or if you're offended by God's people, or you think that you're better than God's people, guess what? One of two things has happened. Either number one, you're not one of God's children, which should terrify you. Or number two, you've been living in rebellion to God's word and you need to make that right. Because I'm telling you right now, the end of the road of isolation is a dumpster fire and it sucks. If I can save you from that reality, I'm going to tell you the truth. The third thing is if you're, if you're a believer and you are loving people well, if you've included God's people into your life and that is the cornerstone of who you are as a person, I want to encourage you, keep going. Have those conversations. Go to those lunches. Go to those coffees. Go to the small group. Go to the Bible study. Be part of God's community. Be part of REACH. Because this is how we display the gospel to the world. And you're doing well, so keep going. We talk about this word a lot, abiding. And the reality is, is that the very first fruit of the Spirit, the Scripture lists, is love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. How do we love each other well if we're not abiding? It could be that you're a follower of Christ right now, but you have gotten caught up in all of the craziness and you just have, are not spending time in God's word. You're not abiding. You're not listening to the master. You're just, you're just tuned him out. And as a result, your relationships are suffering. Your relationships are crumbling. You have division in your life. You have no divine uh, connection to people. So what that means is that I want to encourage you in this. You cannot love your friends. You cannot love God's community without an abiding relationship with Christ. You have to let him be the master of all of it, the day-to-day, -day, everything, all of it. God, when do I get up in the morning? You tell me. I'm going to prioritize my time in your word. I'm not going to say, oh, you know, I, I'm going to catch another 30 minutes. I'll just listen to Shane and Shane on the way to work. It's fine. Because after all, they're singing scripture, right? An abiding relationship with Christ means that you, you actually build your life around Christ and his, and his truth of his word and his community. I want to, I want to uh, just do this one last thing. I know that I've gone long. Guys, I, I, I see this so much in the circles that we run in. How do you, how do you, Tell people about Jesus. We just live, I love God, love people. I'm telling you right now, and this has never been more apparent to me than uh, after studying this passage of Scripture, that we have to prioritize our Christian relationships. We have to take seriously our walk with God. We have to neglect things that are unprofitable to focus on things that are profitable. How much of your life do you need to give to God? All of it. Your relationships, the things that you think that you're entitled to, the things that you think that you need to be complete, everything. I can't tell you that you're going to be married because you know what? After you get married, there's still things that you think you, that you need. That doesn't fulfill you. It's not about having a family. It's not about having the job. It's not about having the, the, the degree. It's not about having the car. The trajectory is a worldly concept that we graduate high school and then we meet somebody in college and then we get married and then we get a job and then we get to buy a house and then we get all the stuff. It's a worldly construct. If I can plead one thing from you, 
It is to defend this right here, the Christian relationships in your life, and to prioritize them. I don't think that Jesus said this by mistake or um, that he did this because it was just the right time, an opportune time. I think he constructed this moment on purpose. Who we allow into our lives is going to determine the direction that we go. So if we do not defend the unity around us, we will be lost. What's up, everybody? This is Philip Jackson, pastor of young adults at Evergreen Church. I want to invite you to come to Reach. We meet every Tuesday evening at 630 at Evergreen Church, just east of Mingo on 111th Street. You can connect with us on social media and on Instagram by searching for reach.tulsa. Also, be sure to subscribe to our content for the latest sermons and updates. You can also find us on Spotify, iTunes, and wherever you find your favorite podcasts. You cross the power of hell, yeah.